Welcome to the video lecture on financing and accessing new infrastructure capacity for natural gas. My name is Sergio Scari, I'm the gas advisor of the Florence School of Regulation and I'm also a senior consultant with the REFI in Milan. First question we have to ask is whether we really need the new or enhanced infrastructure in the gas industry in Europe. Because the gas demand is expected to only slowly recover in Europe uh, after the decline we have seen in the last few years. And more decline is expected after 2020 due to the expansion of renewable energy and to the improvement in energy efficiency. Uh, on the other hand, natural gas is expected to remain in uh, the energy industry with a key role at least uh, as a backup for uh, renewable energy because uh, there are, for example, in Northwestern Europe, at least 500 hours uh, every year, about more than 5% of, of the hours of a year, when there is uh, no wind or sun. And the role of natural gas as a backup will be very important. Uh, so even if the total demand may not increase, peak demand and hence infrastructure, which of course must be tailored to peak demand, uh, is expected to possibly increase a little bit. Outside Europe, strong gas demand is expected that the International Energy Agency is forecasting actually a golden age of gas and the demand for natural gas is indeed uh, quickly increasing in many parts of the world. Here you can see the situation in Europe, however, where uh, the, these are the uh, scenarios which have been uh, developed uh, for the Roadmap 2050 uh, exercise of the European Union. And you see that only in the, in the highest scenarios you have a, a almost constant demand for gas, but uh, on average demand, gas demand is expected to decline. On the other hand, if you look at the, uh, how much uh, gas fire power generation capacity we are expected to require, you will see that uh, such capacity is actually going to increase in many scenarios and only to slowly decline in the, in the worst scenarios. So gas power uh, generation is uh, expected to grow or maybe to remain stable but in the same will happen to pipelines and to other gas infrastructure like LNG terminals or storage. So if some new infrastructure is expected to be needed, uh, the question is how can this uh, infrastructure investment be paid for? For new infrastructure, some long-term commitment is needed. And the reason is that uh, financing institution need uh, some long-term commitment for the uh, long-term investment which is needed. Uh, any gas infrastructure has a, a payback time of at least 20, 30 years, and in some cases even up to 50 or 60 years. Therefore, uh, a long-term commitment is needed by somewhere. But who? Who should pay? There are three basic principles. First principle is the so-called user pays principle. Uh, in the case, I will focus on networks, but the same could uh, be true for other types of infrastructure. Uh, for example, in the case of networks, transmission networks, user pays principle means that the network user, that is the shipper, will commit itself to pay tariffs for capacity for a reasonably long-term period. And the typical tool for uh, market players, for network users to commit themselves, is the open season or maybe the integrated auction. We'll see shortly what it is like. A second principle is the rate payer pays principle. In this case, uh, uh, all uh, market players that are connected to the network will pay for the network improvement or for the new infrastructure. Not only those that, that will use the new infrastructure, but also those who will use 
other parts of the network. In that case, uh, the investment decision is not taken by TSOs based on the commitment of network users, but it's taken based on a decision by a regulatory agency or by a government, it depends, uh, on, for example, by a ministry, it depends on the states, each member state has its own rule. In that case, uh, the new infrastructure or the enhanced infrastructure is included in the asset based and paid for by the all user through the regulated tariffs. In this case, the typical tool for decision is cost-benefit analysis to decide whether a certain new infrastructure is needed or not. Third principle is the taxpayer pays principle. In such case, uh, again, a decision is taken not normally by regulators, but ministries or possibly by the European uh, Commission, or maybe it's a joint decision where uh, some part of the government budgets are uh, devoted to uh, enhancing the infrastructure. And there may be, as I told you, some EC support. Also, this is normally a minor one and it's mostly limited to feasibility studies and other uh, ancillary activities rather than the bulk of the investment. Uh, one, one method to involve uh, uh, and to have decision by market players is uh, the use of long-term auctions. Uh, as you may know, uh, when the new capacity allocation uh, uh, network code uh, will be in force, uh, there will be a possibility to reserve capacity long term by means of auctions where it will be possible to buy mm, strings of multiple short term products uh, for entry points. That already happened in the UK, also with limited success. One problem of this approach is that uh, it's normally applied to individual interconnection points, but uh, in many cases, uh, shippers are more interested in uh, connections of several uh, interconnection points. That is in what uh, in, in the gas target border studies we have called link chains. Uh, chains of several interconnection points along a single route, which uh, may be needed. For example, if you want to import gas, say, from Russia into France, you have to cross uh, three, four, five different zones, uh, price zones, which are run by different TSOs, and so you have to cross and take capacity in as many interconnection points. But with the capacity allocation method uh, mechanism which is going to be uh, adopted, there will be no such possibility. Uh, and each interconnection point must be booked uh, standalone. Uh, on the other hand, recently there has not been much interest by the private sector and by network users to book capacity long term. And the reason is that at present capacity is uh, abundant on most interconnection points. There are important exceptions, of course, but uh, uh, in most cases uh, it's not been necessary and it's not seen as necessary to commit uh, long term. That's uh, because of the crisis, because of the relatively ex uh, um, poor expectation of further growth uh, and the availability of short term capacity where it's possible to uh, book capacity on the short term without long term commitment. In such auctions, of course, regulator tariffs are used as reserve prices. Uh, I told you that uh, the typical uh, tool to reserve capacity long term and promote the development of new infrastructure uh, in the case, uh, uh, in case uh, uh, the user, user pays principle applies is the open season. 
The open season is actually an American import. It's an established procedure that has been used in uh, North America for many years for market-based decision on new pipelines and other infrastructures. Uh, th this has been uh, imported into Europe uh, with uh, some good success. Uh, in this case, investment decisions are based on the results of a market test. Uh, promoters of a new uh, infrastructure uh, are supposed to advertise the new project, but also to allow other parties to join in at fair conditions. Such conditions are defined and it's normally possible to book capacity at conditions which are more or less announced. In some cases, it's also possible to join the project by purchasing equity in, uh, in, the, um, uh, in the project, but that uh, happens only on a voluntary basis. Uh, the decision criteria, whether the investment will be done or not, uh, is, has to be decided in advance. And typically, criteria are defined like a minimum booked capacity or a minimum internal rate of return for the investment. It's quite common to uh, choose a certain percentage of capacity, for example, 50% of new capacity. Not all capacity is uh, requested. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, some part of the risk is uh, supposed to be left uh, on the shoulders of uh, the promoters of the investment, uh, but uh, if you uh, get 50% of capacity, you are probably going to finance more than 50%, maybe 17 or 80% of the cost. And the reason is that uh, the capacity that is booked is uh, normally in the first period of the, uh, li of the useful life of the new infrastructure. If the new infrastructure is expected to last for maybe 40 or 50 years, uh, you cannot expect uh, uh, network users to purchase capacity for as, as many years. In most cases, the commitment is only for 5 to 15 years which means uh, considering the lead time, the time necessary to build the infrastructure, it means that normally capacity is uh, to be booked for a period which, uh, which is uh, from, say, five years from now until maybe uh, 20 years from now. Um, but that is uh, uh, enough because, of course, uh, um, other uh, revenue flows, which are farther away in the, in the future, will have a lower value today because of discounting. And so you are going to get a, a significant part of the expected cost back. And that's supposed to be enough for, uh, to decide on the investment. In fact, uh, other criteria are based, on, as I told you, on internal rate of return. That's actually uh, preferable and it's most common in the US because, of course, the financial valuation uh, is preferable, uh, even though, of course, you must agree on the discount rate. Um, good. Um, in uh, Europe, uh, open season have been subject to some uh, guidelines of good practice. This guidance of good practice uh, uh, basically requires two stages. A first stage of the market test uh, is just uh, informative. Uh, interested uh, network users uh, signal their interest in the new infrastructure but take no commitment. In the second stage, if uh, uh, the results are regarded as satisfactory, uh, the promoters of the initiative uh, invite uh, network users, uh, uh, any other party which is inter uh, that is interested, uh, to send binding commitments. Uh, of course, I have no time to explain how these commitments are made binding, but capacity is basically purchased long term. 
it's uh, subject to some rules, and these rules are, of course, subject to regulatory approval. For example, long-term capacity is uh, purchased, but is always subject to the congestion management rules, uh, like the use it or lose it clause. In fact, in the European Union, we have seen some success of this approach, as I told you, but also some situations where governments have not been happy with the open season results. And especially in the last few years, we have seen that governments have wanted to, wanted to invest more than it was decided by the open season. And the main reason for this uh, is typically security of supply. Of course, it's totally legitimate for uh, European governments uh, to be willing to invest more than the private sector would like in order to boost security of supply, but also uh, to boost competition. Uh, on the other hand, this intervention is, uh, may, in a sense, uh, crowd out demand from uh, the private sector and from network users. If network users feel that uh, capacity will be provided by the governments anyway, then uh, it, will be, it is likely that at least uh, some market players may decide not to bid for the capacity because they think that capacity will be provided anyway and later on capacity will be abundant and they will be able to get it on a short-term basis and without long-term commitments. Uh, well, we must consider that the implementation of the uh, capacity allocation network code will have, and also of the tariff network code, will have an impact on this. And the reason is that the ratio between long-term capacity and short-term capacity depends, of course, on the prices. If it's uh, cheaper or, say, just as expensive to buy short-term capacity rather than long-term capacity, why should people uh, bother to purchase capacity long term. Uh, if you consider other competitive industries, you may notice that almost always capacity or any other good which is bought on a long term basis and so for larger total amounts is uh, normally cheaper. I mean, uh, the unit cost of such capacity is cheaper, it's like a fidelization program uh, of customers, where if you agree to a fidelization customer pro uh, program for customers, you get uh, some discounts. Uh, so you pay less for each unit of the product you're going to pay, you're going to buy. The regulation of tariffs, which are used uh, as a reserve prices, that is, as a minimum prices for the auctions, uh, does also affect uh, the result uh, of, uh, uh, the, of the decision for new uh, investment. In fact, if uh, uh, short-term capacity is priced at a relatively low level, then people may prefer to book short-term capacity. That's against the typical economic logic where long-term capacity should be, on average, cheaper than short-term capacity. And that happens in any uh, industry where, for example, if you have a fidelization program for customers so that you manage to sell the product or sell the service for, uh, for a longer period, then you offer a discount because more of your capacity is used. And the same happens in gas transportation or in the use of other gas infrastructure. Uh, that's, uh, uh, if a regulation does not allow for that, you may have the case where 
demand for short-term capacity is relatively high, while demand for long-term is low. Uh, let me finally talk about the integrated auction. Integrated auction is a, a way of, in a sense, combining auctions with uh, open seasons. Because after all, you could say, and it's a clever idea, again, also this idea comes from the UK. Um, it's a good idea because uh, after all, uh, network users are not interested uh, to know whether capacity is already there or should be developed. They want capacity anyway. So if capacity is not there, they would like to have a procedure for to increase the capacity. And that is the idea of the integrated auction. If more capacity is requested than available, then a market test for capacity enhancement is launched. And this market test may be even integrated in, in uh, the auction software, or it may be a separate solution. These uh, uh, open seasons may be mandatory or voluntary, but of course the real integrated auction is when this is mandatory. Uh, and this is uh, most effective if one or two of these hosts are involved. It's more e most effective if there is a single inter interconnection point. If there are several interconnection inter points involved, and we are, if you are dealing with link chains, as I mentioned earlier, then open season are likely to provide more flexibility and are likely to be uh, a better tool because they can accommodate different solutions because they are less, I would say, less mechanical and are in open season are procedure where you can uh, discuss and bargain as necessary to uh, have a best tailored uh, solution to your need for incremental capacity. That was uh, uh, my presentation on this topic. Thank you very much for your attention. Here is my email address in case you would like to contact me to talk about these issues. Thank you very much.